Barbara Yoshida Bethune. My grandfather, Gohachi Yoshida, made four chests. Mm -hmm. And my uh, one for my mother, and one for his three daughters. So my mother was the mother of his daughter-in-law and three others for his daughters in the camps. Mm -hmm. So my, uh, I grew up with that chest. Mm -hmm. So my brother now has that, that's in Idaho. And we always knew that it was made in the camps. Mm -hmm. And my uh, cousin Marilyn has her mother's chest and she's a daughter. And I inherited this from my Auntie Neil. Neil Uchiyama, she used to be Neil Yoshida in Fife. And, um, so that piece is original. It was wood was a little distressed just from the age. Mm -hmm. So a woodworker friend of mine just said, told me not to do anything with it. Don't try to make it pretty. Mm -hmm. But it could probably use a little oil. I think it was tongue oil. I'm not sure. He put mm -hmm. on it and just lightly uh, polished it just to keep the wood um, in good shape. Right. So that's all that's been done to it. And it was kind of stacked and just with a bunch of other stuff. Mm -hmm. But my parents, um, when we were growing up, that little chest was in our hallway. And it had always had things in it. It was always a piece of furniture that was we could see mm -hmm. as part of our everyday life. Mm -hmm. um, and so my brother has it, and he has it in his living room now. Mm -hmm. I don't know what he has inside, but on top he has a Japanese doll. Mm -hmm. And uh, where we have ours now, it's a um, it's in our downstairs, and then we have the Yoshida family crest and the Sagami family crest. Mm -hmm. My aunt gave those to all of us for at a family reunion. So we have those two and then the chest, and then we have uh, a little lacquer bowl. Apparently, we were a twelve year old that um, my father's side of the family gave to my mother's side when they were married, so I have one of those still. Mm -hmm. And they were married in 1984. So, it kind of has some old objects and just family things, so right. it's just, uh, fits very nicely with it. The bird, mm -hmm. yeah, the birds, I remember them, um, they were in um, my bedroom, and my mom had some chiffon curtains mm -hmm. and a little sash, and the little birds were just, she pinned them on the sash. Mm -hmm. So I just thought they were birds. They were kind of cute. Mm -hmm. So growing up, we always had them. And she gave them to me, and I put them in a little box. I really didn't think that much of them. I mean, mm -hmm. I just kind of nice. And she told me that they were, uh, my grandfather made them in the camps, but it really didn't register. Right. So those poor little birds were in a little box, mm -hmm. and we lived overseas, mm -hmm. and we must have moved 10, 12 times in three different countries. Wow. I, I don't know where those little birds were, where they got shoved all through that time. But one day, um, um, recently, I had a book club group at my house, and one of my friends said, you know, Barbara, uh, you might be interested in the National Parks Magazine has an article on artwork in the camps. Mm -hmm. And so I knew nothing about this. So she brought the, uh, the, the magazine. When I saw the front and saw the birds, I realized I had some. Mm -hmm. And so for some incredible reason, I was able to find them right away. <laughs> Usually I put things and they get lost right. and I've never seen them again for years. Mm -hmm. So I saw them and our book group was just incredulous. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I got the, uh, the book, The Art of Gaman, and started doing a little bit of research and realized how precious these were. Right. And, uh, well, and I, had, I thought I had quite a bit of information and knowledge about the camps, because I used to give talks and mm -hmm. about the uh, experience of our family. But I had no knowledge that they had the arts and crafts uh, classes in the camps, nor that my grandfather did more than just, you know, just made these little objects. Mm -hmm. um, so there's so much more meaning to it. Right. And I think it's a wonderful thing that there is this kind of exhibition in the word mm -hmm. come on. Mm -hmm. It's very inspiring. Yeah. And uh, I think it's something that my two children, mm -hmm. uh, it's a legacy that they can carry on. Mm -hmm. So I think it's something that could have been very easily lost. My mother said, oh, you know, that grandpa made this in camp. Mm -hmm. And that's all I knew. And see, we knew nothing about camp. 
Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I thought that my parents went to summer camp, and I thought, and I remember thinking, how could they go to summer camp? Because they're so poor. They were so poor. Uh -huh. And uh, so I conjured in my mind, as many of the sons they did, huh. that camp was a fun experience. Oh. And they talk about going home, back to the coast. Mm -hmm. But we stayed in Iowa. And so my parents would talk about back home, before camp. Mm -hmm. um, but they were just words to us, and they never, ever talked about their camp experience see. when we were growing up. I found out, I think I was about a senior, junior, senior in high school. It was so incredulous, I, I couldn't put my head around it. Right. And in college, I wrote a paper mm -hmm. uh, for some class, but there was so little information. Right. It was it was a short paper. Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't until quite a bit later. And that we were living in Europe, and I was giving talks to the international schools. Mm -hmm. And when I first gave the talk, there was just like a couple sentences mm -hmm. in the history and then history books, and then over the years it got to be a full paragraph, and then now it's like a, when I left it was like a page and a half with a couple pictures, so it did become more known, mm -hmm. but still I find a lot of people just have no knowledge of this at all, so I think the art of Guam mm -hmm. is a wonderful way to bring the message of what happened. Yeah, definitely. In a very inspiring way. Yes and got very little in response. Mm. And I think it was just so painful. Right. They wanted to blot it out. In fact, my sister uh, was born in 1940. Mm -hmm. Her name is Anne Mieko. Mm -hmm. okay, I was born in 1945. My name is Barbara Gale. Mm -hmm. And my two younger brothers are David Lee, and my youngest brother is Bruce Michael. And we speak no Japanese. Right. So I could say, you know, go with mm -hmm. You know, go and I send. But Japanese was not spoken in our house. But we had on uh, New Year's Day mm -hmm. all the Japanese food, mm -hmm. and uh, my mother cooked quite a bit of Japanese food. Mm -hmm. So we have those traditions that hopefully carry on to my children. They did, my mother got them, but uh, nobody talked about them. So um, it was just actually kind of miraculous that uh, they were intact, you know, the three or the four of them are intact and in such good condition that there was no talk about the history of, you know, uh, other than just their living camp. Right. Yes, and the fact that they preserved it, kept it, and then passed it on to the next generation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so it, uh, after I put the connection of the word gaman mm -hmm. and art, in the camps, I looked at the chest and the birth with a whole different perspective. Now. Right. So it's been it's been it's been fun to mm -hmm. explore this and and uh, dig a little deeper into our history because it puts it puts so much more depth because we've um, read a lot, seen a lot about what happened during the war years and. A lot of stories and books, but the art of the mind, I think, just captures mm -hmm. a lot deeper feeling about it all. Right. So I really appreciate that we've been able to discover this, and I'm really, really happy that uh, my grandfather, Gohachi, mm -hmm. his work is, will be displayed. And it was to international schools who knew nothing about this, so a lot of international students, who, and the uh, American students. Mm -hmm. knew very little or nothing. So I, when we lived overseas, I, I just spoke at a lot of different schools mm -hmm. about that. But that was before I knew anything about the Art of Gaman. I just found that out when the uh, National Parks magazine came out. A lot of people were shocked and they wanted to know why we didn't know about this. They, were, they couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty standard. And then some people knew a little bit about it mm -hmm. and thought it was, you know, saying how shameful, how horrible. Um, but I think that what uh, uh, is so important now is the relevancy mm -hmm. of uh, excluding a group of people mm -hmm. who are what they look like right. or for their beliefs. Right. So I think that's why it's so important to, to make sure that this doesn't go away and we forget about it. First, if it says Helena, Montana, mm -hmm. and everybody asks, well, how are you born in Helena? Mm -hmm. And so it's right uh, in June 16th. 
So we were only there for a while. Then my parents uh, moved back down to Idaho, mm -hmm. and they just stayed there. So but all during the war years, there were, um, you could elect, because they were so short of agricultural labor, mm -hmm. that uh, they could elect to go and work on farms. So they were like uh, migrant, they were migrant laborers under house arrest. So they could go and work the farm, but they always had to act, you know, the authorities know where they were. Wow. So they moved a number of times. Mm -hmm. My mother did talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Some of the experiences were positive, where they were treated well. Mm -hmm. Others, not so much. So, but they, you know, my parents preferred to do that rather than stay incarcerated mm -hmm. in camps. So, mm -hmm. uh, we lived on a farm, and we were the only Japanese when they were about 20 miles. Mm -hmm. And there were only a few other Japanese in the, in the uh, Boise Valley, so mm -hmm. we weren't that many. So we were the only Japanese, and there was one other family um, uh, at, at our school. But my mother always uh, uh, instilled in us that we had to get really good grades. We couldn't do anything wrong because we would be fingered. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was drummed into us. So I remember uh, I was in high school, and there was a letter from the school board. And so I thought, oh my gosh, I wonder what this is. And so I was just dying, and I was thinking of hiding it. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of steaming it open, <laughs> and I was just waiting for something awful to happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I just remember that my mom was at the iron board, and uh, she got the letter, and she opened it. Well, I got into honor society, but I was the second child, mm -hmm. so I could get away with more things, mm -hmm. which I did. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, my parents are always worried because they just didn't want us to be noticed at all. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to, one day, my uh, cousin did this, took a trip through Montana mm -hmm. and just retraced the number of places where our parents are relatives have stayed. Mm -hmm. And apparently there are some uh, people that still remember uh, uh, our family. And then we have some relatives, actually, that just stayed there and settled. So mm -hmm. I think it'd be a nice journey to go back and get a piece of history. Yeah, it would be nice to experience. Right. Yeah. It was a four years out of their life that they stayed there. Yeah. Yeah. So they, I remember things like Chinook and uh, some of the places that they talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, whitefish and places like that they talked about, but they wouldn't go into detail. Growing up and dating, if somebody wanted to ask me out, that was fine. Mm -hmm. But my brothers, I think, may have had a different experience. If they asked somebody out mm -hmm. and the girl said no, they never know if it was because their parents wouldn't allow it or because they just didn't like them. Oh, so it's a little, I think there's a little bit of a difference. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we were, our identity growing up in a completely Caucasian environment was different. When they first moved to Seattle, I was shocked that there were so many Japanese. That, that was the time when the Japanese were the predominant minority mm -hmm. uh, Asian group. And I was just shocked and kind of got used to that. And then I had a scholarship to study in Japan mm -hmm. one summer. And so I was on the airplane and the stewardess in the Japan Airlines spoke to me in Japanese. And I thought, why is she speaking to me in Japanese? <laughs> because my identity wasn't right. Japanese. So then I got to Japan and just saw waves and waves of Japanese. Mm -hmm. And I was there for uh, two months. And so that's why I can learn to say, Nihongo wakarimasen, Nihongo hanashimasen, mm -hmm. because I, that's all I could say. But I'd say that, and people would say, well, why can't she, you know, she's speaking Japanese, what's wrong with her? Right. So then I'd have to explain that my grandparents came, you know, the Bacha and the Jicha came from Japan. And that I'm a, they were Issei, my parents were Nisei, I'm a Sansei from Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, then they understand that I have to go through this whole lengthy family history. Mm -hmm. So when I came back after that experience, um, the hyphen from Japanese American mm -hmm. became really stood out a lot more. So right. I think that having that experience of seeing, experiencing Japanese in Japan, mm -hmm. Japanese in a huge uh, urban area like Seattle, mm -hmm. and being brought up Japanese in a very rural, uh, took a while to kind of coalesce that kind of 
identity? Well, at that time, this is in the 70s, and a lot of the you know, people thought that I was you know, young and being smart, mm -hmm. yeah, which is a huge insult. Mm -hmm. So nothing to go through and explain. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think that anytime um, any background that you have, you know, whether you're Italian, Greek, Japanese, whatever, you go into another country mm -hmm. and you go back to your heritage, mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, really helps you with your identity. Mm -hmm. And we lived in Singapore, and because I lived Japanese, mm -hmm. I had some interesting experiences there because of the war. Mm -hmm. So you just have to kind of say, you know, all over the world, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times you can be judged on your looks, mm -hmm. and then you, then you have to then take that next step. Mm -hmm. 